Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. It's a lovely spring evening. You could be probably 100 different places tonight, um, and you're here participating in our civic affairs, uh, taking time to get educated, to raise your voices up, to ask your questions uh, about a really serious, you know, important series of issues facing the city as we talk about our Central Hill campus planning opportunities. My name is Brad Rawson. I'm a Somerville resident. Uh, I live over on the west side in Ward 7, uh, just off of North Street. I'm a Somerville dad. Uh, my two-year-old is going to come to the brand new Somerville High School 14 years from now. Uh, as my, my uh, you know, Midwestern grandfather said, Lord willing, and the crick don't rise. So um, it's a really exciting time for all of us. Um, I serve as the mayor's uh, director of transportation and infrastructure. We have an awesome little team of five staff that's responsible for parks, for urban forestry and for transportation planning. Many of you who I know from the Resistat series and many other uh, elements of our public life will know that we're responsible for everything from small scale neighborhood traffic calming issues, bicycle and pedestrian safety, all the way up to saving the green line. Um, we do parks, we do urban forestry, green infrastructure. We're just one small part of a great staff team who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, we've got about, what, 90 minutes worth of content tonight, folks, um, and I'll be here just as MC to kind of kick things off. So, quick show of hands, who's ready to stop having community meetings in this basement where your voices are drowned out by the uh, uh, commercial fridges uh, and, and actually enjoy the new uh, uh, learning environment and, and meeting space that will be built as part of the high school? I mean, I'm jazzed. The fact that we voted uh, uh, to, to build our new high school is just so darn exciting, and yet it's only part of the actual public land here uh, up on the hill. We've got acres and acres of green space. We've got street adjacency issues, traffic congestion issues, walking and, and biking connections to the community path and the green line, and this is a really important opportunity for us to take a step back and say, what are the pieces that fit in with the scope that uh, our great team at SMMA, who's the architects uh, for the high school, and Suffolk, who's our builder, at the high school, what are the elements that they're actually not responsible for, and how can we make sure that the city is mobilizing public and, and private resources in and around the neighborhood so that everybody can walk here if they have a choice to, if they want to, um, that everybody can participate, you know, within the public spaces, that our veterans are uh, properly honored, and that we've got great rhythm of our monuments, um, that we've got great access to our central library. So let me quickly introduce uh, the interdisciplinary staff team. First and foremost, uh, on my team and my little staff of five, Mike Tremblay who's our senior transportation planner, professional engineer, uh, and, and uh, you know, just a, a, a guru of everything related to traffic calming, uh, bus operations, bicycle and pedestrian mobility, uh, as well as parking issues. Uh, from a housekeeping standpoint, it's important to tell you all, this is not a parking meeting. Mike, when's the next parking meeting? June 20th of next month, so I'll see you all there if you want to talk about parking. Yep. But uh, let's try and keep the conversation focused on the planning effort for the campus. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, Kristen Stelgis is actually our project manager in the mayor's summer stat office. That's our office of innovation and, and uh, analytics. Um, so Kristen's been the actual project manager, in part because, as you see from this slide, um, we've got uh, you know so many different areas of public policy that we want to talk about. Um, Glenn Ferdman, our fantastic library director, is here. Uh, again, central library uh, and that lifelong learning environment uh, and making sure everything is inviting to everybody, no matter what your age or ability or interests are, um, is really a part of the story here for the central planning, uh, central uh, campus planning. And not, last but not least, in the back from our staff, Melissa Woods, senior planner in our planning and zoning group. Melissa is a Somerville resident as well um, and has been working with us and George Proakis's planning team. Um, so that's it for our staff. Uh, I'll introduce Alex, uh, who will move on to our consultant team. SMMA is our lead. Again, they're the architects of record and the designers of this awesome high school, uh, and they're joined by an awesome sub-consultant team, uh, including Tool Design Group, who we work with on bicycle, pedestrian, and transit issues every day. They're some of the best in the business. So we're going to be in good hands. Um, you know, the mayor is at two other meetings tonight, kind of like I am, uh, so he sends his regards. It was his vision to make sure that we had the resources and the opportunity for folks to actually have these bigger conversations. Um, so he does send his regards. He's totally jazzed about uh, Central Hill campus planning issues, um, and you'll be in good hands with our staff and our consultant team tonight. So again, thanks for coming out. Look forward to working with you and your neighbors who couldn't be here tonight uh, as, as we move forward in this planning process. And this is Alex Pitkin. Thanks, Brad. Does that mean Joe's Jazz Festival moves up to the high school site? Uh, you never know. Right? You know yeah. It's going to be a great amphitheater back here. <laughs> so, thanks for uh, having us this evening. Uh, again, my name is Alex Pitkin. I'm an architect uh, heavily involved in the high school project, which was a massive team for SMMA and many of our consultants as well. Uh, introduce a few other folks with you who are with me tonight. Lorraine Finnegan. 
She's our project manager. She's also going to be managing the Central Hill uh, planning process that we're going to go through. Samantha Farrell and Laura Moneys, landscape architects. Laura is also a planner by training and profession. Liz Galloway, Elizabeth Galloway. She's our sustainability expert on this project. Uh, Aaron Prestilio. The complexity of the site, you know, I, I always kind of say this when I talk to folks that it's just on order of magnitude more complex than the average high school or planning project with all the slopes, all the urban conditions, uh, also coordinating with the GLX team, working with obviously the great folks at the city. And so having uh, this vast set of resources within our own firm is extremely helpful for us to kind of work through all the challenges. Uh, but then we're also joined today by Ashley Hare and Stephanie Weyer from the multimodal planning team of Tool. They were not involved in the high school project, but they're engaged and right up to speed on it because they have so much knowledge about the city uh, and thinking about all the context around the high school site and Central Hill. Uh, unfortunately, Building Conserva uh, Conservation Associates, Lisa Howe, was ill tonight. Uh, as you may be aware that some of the uh, things that we're going to be talking about tonight include a lot of historic elements that are here today. No decisions have been made, but the city has been having active conversations about what to do with uh, the war memorials that kind of worked their way uh, up and down Highland Avenue. Should they remain on site? Should they be conserved? They all want, need to be conserved and have work done on them, but should some of them be collected and uh, moved elsewhere in the city, given a different type of honor? That's all part of the conversation that we're having. How many of you folks have actually been to high school meetings or been on the website and are kind of aware of the project? Okay, good. So I'll try to be brief uh, because we do have such a long uh, evening, but we did think we should put the context of the high school project in front of you. Uh, we were engaged back in April to start to think about the rest of the site planning on Central Hill. Uh, back in April. So we've been doing a couple of months of work to get to this point tonight where we want to be before you. We're not going to be showing you any anything other than the conversation pieces and the conversations that we've been having with various folks such as Glenn, Michael, uh, Brad, and others and to solicit some input from you about your uh, feelings about Central Hill and uh, in the neighborhood. You, you can see that uh, this is our kickoff meeting. We're planning on having two more meetings in the fall when we will be coming forth with some activities, we'll be here with you talking about very specific ideas, soliciting more feedback, uh, and that will inform the final uh, campus planning study that will wrap up by the end of the year. So just a quick introduction on the campus. Right from the get-go, when we were awarded the project working with the city and the MSBA, School Building Authority, which is a partner in this exercise as well and helping to fund uh, roughly about 50% of the project for the city, uh, we immediately knew that the high school did not sit in isolation like many communities. That in fact, it's part of a very rich uh, cultural and urban context. And so we immediately started to think about all the important planning, Resistat work, uh, and Somerset work that's gone on both for Union Square and Gilman Square, which are sort of the immediate urban context on either side of uh, the north side and south side of the hill. There's a very rich history, both civic and educationally, to Central Hill. So we went back and did a little bit of homework on that. Uh, School Street actually was the first spot for which was not City Hall, but was the first high school in Somerville. Uh, and then you could also see that there was a, a, a community meeting house and for one of the first churches, Highland Avenue, was actually called Church Street. Very quickly started to aggregate more buildings, the Latin School and the first public library on the hill. Then the 1895 English High School, which is still the main entrance today that you came in, had wings added onto that in 1914. And then in 1927, we really see the primary context for the school as we know it today. And then we actually illustrated some of the things that have happened over time, the fire on the roof, which actually took off that sort of very beautiful hip roof that once existed and gives it its sort of uh, flat skyline appearance. And then in the 1980s, the mid-80s, the vocational programs were brought up to the school, unifying Summer of a High School within the city. Quite unique, uh, there are about eight of these school programs around uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, so Somerville is unique to be able to serve every one of its students within the city in this capacity. Very exciting programs happen here in the school. 
Uh, and so I think it's something you can also dig deeper into uh, the work that we did with the educational plan and the program effort if you so choose. And then looking forward to 2021 uh, and as you can see the high school has started to migrate further to the east closer to the main uh, central library uh, and basically the main entrance for the new high school will be approximately where the entrance to the atrium is today. Uh, a lot of conversations in the two years that we've been working on the project. Mass Historic, Somerville Historic, a uh, lot of uh, participation and input as to what was important on Central Hill during the high school planning process. So not just an educational perspective, but also sort of a physical, uh, sort of qualitative aspect. And so this is the War Memorial. Its original life was as the gymnasium up on Central Hill. Uh, today it's the library upstairs. And in 2021, it will be uh, the auditorium. So it'll actually be the theater space very prominently placed on Highland Avenue. And then the 1895 building, I'm gonna have to give that a new name. It doesn't sound very characteristic of what's gonna be important for that. But uh, this was determined not to be suitable for educational purposes moving forward, but it gives the city a great asset for added space on the hill. And then, you know, of course, the main branch of the library and City Hall itself, which bookend uh, the campus plan that we're talking about tonight. Uh, during that process, uh, we worked on a memorandum of agreement that you have to have uh, as part of the state planning process. And so we worked very closely, again, with Somerville Historic Preservation. And the building pieces that were going to be removed, we decided that there were learning opportunities here as well. And so many of the decorative elements were actually, you can maybe look at some of the demolition going right now, on right now. We're carefully taking those off. And we're placing some of those in the building. There's uh, a number of CTE programs in the school that involve construction, engineering, architecture. So we think that these can be learning uh, elements within the school. And then just a couple of images. Maybe you've seen these uh, recently. Uh, again, the main entrance, approximately where the, uh, the atrium is today. You can see that we're looking at a building that's highly sustainable, uh, really thinking about something that is forward-looking. Every building that was ever built on the hill was of its time. And so we are also working along that design uh, criteria. And then, as Brad was alluding to, uh, t between City Hall, 1895, and the War Memorial Building, you can see this element, which is the secondary entrance to the school. And that is going to serve as a lecture hall or a forum space. This is just one of the many very sort of very flexible types of uh, rooms and spaces that are going to be available to the city. And any of you who know the school today know that there are just not rooms like this. Not that we want to populate it with lecture halls, but just to have one of these is a, just in this context of a major school is very important. And this will be really useful to the city for holding meetings. We could be in there tonight. Uh, uh, school committee, uh, various uh, public meetings can definitely be uh, conducted. And then uh, quickly, School Street's perspective, I think one of the greatest changes uh, to the, uh, the hilltop will be the fact that we're taking the sort of utilitarian back of the school which faces north in Gilman Square and we're adding some open space. And we've looked back uh, in time and although we can't go back to 1895, we can certainly take some inspiration from what was down the hill in the past. And you can see that the back of the 1895 building in fact was intended to be seen. Uh, and you can see some of these images of the Central Library. So although we're, we've lost that open space to the east, we can regain that on the west side of the site. And then, because it's a very new environment, we've also been challenged and we've been working very closely with the school to create, again, places of honor within the building, both for students and for civic uh, and uh, display purposes throughout the school. Quickly, what you're gonna to start to see on the Hill, you've already witnessed the placement of the modulars. So the students are already in there learning, uh, being taught for the next year or so. Uh, you can see that there's enabling work going on in the wing C, as we call it. That's being abated, and that will be removed this summer. And then construction of phase one, which is about 30% of the educational program of the new high school. And then there's a whole series of sub-phases having to do with the existing parts of the building. 
the gymnasium field house, the shops below that, same with the war memorial, uh, and that the new theater and the spaces underneath that. Uh, and then we'll be working on phase two, which is again, uh, some enabling work to take down the easternmost part of, part of the building and then build phase uh, two. Then we'll be removing the rest of the wings around the high school, which will clear the way for the field. And there's some shots of the, uh, uh, the modulars. I put a website up here really quickly. This will all be up on the, uh, uh, the city's website. But this is, uh, you can see a live camera of the construction. This will be up, uh, Suffolk will be hosting this and they'll be showing sort of a live construction stream uh, throughout the entire two or three years of construction. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Samantha. Thank you. So looking at the site, um, the high school study was tough to define a certain site boundary. The site is one continuous piece of land in terms of parcels. So we have, um, if I can get the clicker to work, we have our main city hall, the 1895 that Alex has been referring to, the high school and the library, all in one piece of property. As we were looking at this for the high school study, we wanted to master plan it. So this graphic and that board I think a couple people were talking about is an idea that we had developed from the high school itself. Um, working with the city and the mayor, it was trying to develop a plan that really encompassed the full neighborhood and the context connecting down to GLX and all the way up to Highland. Um, but this is the start of the project for us. So the campus master plan is something that, um, sorry, the Central Hill campus plan is something that will have this as a starting point, but then develop with the community and the city different ideas to ultimately come to um, a plan that will help to inform a lot of different spaces throughout this site. The Somerville High School project limits are highlighted in the bolder colors. Um, but all of it is really going to be up for discussion and design as we develop the campus plan. Everything that's highlighted in pink is what we want to help focus on and look at different opportunities with the community. So as you can see, there's a few elements of the high school design that have been off limits um, in terms of ADA and accessibility and also um, the development of the field. That's something that we're not gonna touch once we develop it, but everything highlighted in pink along Highland and especially the library corner and the city hall corner um, on School Street and Walnut are going to be important aspects of the design as we move forward with the community. Once we start to define these spaces, um, an organization starts to take place on campus and something that we've seen and developed with the city is a civic core and an academic core. So with the Civic Corps, we have the City Hall, we have the 1895 campus, um, and we also have a community entrance that's associated with the high school. So this starts to become very civically minded. Alex um, had mentioned the lecture hall. This is an idea of um, community spaces that are going to engage the, the city and the community as well. Looking to the academic core, that's going to be the main entrance for your high school campus. So that's going to be um, students, large plaza spaces, outdoor classrooms, playgrounds. In association with um, the library corner, it's going to develop this academic space um, that's really defined by the LA of trees as well as the buildings. When we start to break down some of these opportunities, um, we see the Civic Plaza, the Playfield, and the Library Greens as programming opportunities for the site. So what type of events the community wants to see? We want to hear that type of feedback, um, especially your civic events. So we know there's a tree lighting. We know there's different, um, different menorahs and um, trash collections that happen on site. These are all things that are important to us to hear feedback so that we can develop those flexible spaces for you. The play field I had mentioned is something that we're not going to touch, but we can definitely program. So ultimate frisbee tournaments, um, having food trucks back there, what would excite you as the community members and help you to visit this site and utilize it to the best and highest use of its ability. And then the library green as well. Um, Porch Fest, trying to make this side of the site um, more engaging and allowing it to be a new gateway to the site um, because we want access from each corner of this beautiful campus. 
So um, I'm going to open it up for a discussion really quickly for more information. These are going to be our websites. There's the high school website. Um, just below that will be the Central Hill campus plan that we're focusing on today. And then, um, as Alex mentioned, the construction camera is the, the last link there. So we'll have all of this posted on the websites, um, and you can refer to the presentation later. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So we do have a schedule we're trying to hit. We're not sure if everyone is here for the entire night or if people are coming for different segments. Um, let me just page down. That should go back. Our next segment is transportation. But if anybody had any comments or wanted to make any inquiries, uh, so the one thing I think I need you to do is come up to the mic, sir, because this is low in charge, so we need to make sure it's captured, if you don't mind. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could go back a couple slides, the larger picture of the whole space, and maybe point out where the community path fits within the high school campus layout. Thank you. The community path um, is in the lighter gray uh, since it's not part of our project boundary, but we're still developing it along with the GLX extension. Um, so it's proposed along the northern side of the site. Um, this will be the access to the high school site up a set of stairs and then there will be a public access stair that connects this main spine all the way into the Civic Plaza to the southern side of the site with Highland. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what percentage of the current student body lives adjacent to, to the new Green Line stations? Melissa, do you happen to have an answer for that? The question was, what percentage of high school students live adjacent to a green line? Um, you need to use the mic. Yes. <laughs> I do have a loud mouth, but... Uh, the, the green line extension will uh, expand uh, transportation access for the entirety of the city. Um, I've never seen it by where our current high school students live, but um, our our current population, 15%, um, are within walking distance to a train station. And when the green line opens, it will be 80%. Any other questions on this portion of the presentation? If not, it's 6.30, and I think we'll, we'll jump right to transportation. Better? Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Ashley Hare. I'm with Tool Design Group, and I'm an engineer. And I'm here with my colleague, Stephanie Wire. And we're super excited to be part of this project, working with S... SMMA? Is that? Okay, it's sensitive then. Um, we're really excited to be part of this project and working with SMMA in the city. We're working closely with Mike Tremblay, who you met a moment ago, and Brad Rawson, who I think has taken off for another meeting. So our role in this project is to look at transportation, every aspect of transportation. So not just driving, but who's getting here on foot, who's on bike, who's coming by transit, and, and what the... Uh, green line means for the bus routes in the area as well. So these are the modes that we're looking at. And these arrows don't necessarily represent directions. It's just people coming from all different directions to get to the campus by a variety of different means. So let's talk first about driving. As was mentioned earlier, the parking discussion is going to be happening on June 20th. So Right now, what we're gonna focus on is mobility and access to the site. So this is a map of the one-way and two-way streets in the area. And if any of y'all have driven to the site, I know it's probably easier to get here if you've done it before, right? So one of the things we're gonna be looking at is getting to and from which streets work in a one-way configuration, which ones might be better with two-way. Um, would wayfinding help if you're trying to get to the site? We, you know, look at maybe some signing options to point people in the right direction. For walking, people are coming from all directions to the campus on foot, right? And right now, that could be kind of tough. We've got some topography issues with the hills, but each corner of the campus also has a signalized intersection, and there aren't a lot of crossings in between those signalized intersections. So what you see here with 
the yellow dots, these are crosswalks that lead to the campus site. And down here on Highland Ave, we've got one mid-block crossing that has a sign in the middle of the road but is not currently signalized. Um, another facet of getting to the site on foot is that all of the pedestrian walk signals, the little white person that's outlined or the hand, those all require pushing the button to get that signal to come up. So are there things we could do there, maybe make those automated so they come up every cycle length? Those are the kind of things we're going to be, need to be looking at. And this is that mid-block crossing right there in front of Highland Avenue. Yielding rates by vehicles, from what I've seen, are pretty good, but there's probably some things we could do to draw more attention to that location, maybe um, induce drivers to yield more frequently, um, draw some more attention to it with maybe some signalization options or hybrid beacons. And then this is what I was talking about with the lack of additional crossings that are available. You can cross at the signals on the corners, but what happens in the middle of the block? So here we're going to be looking at crash data, um, the, the things the city has already collected as far as their Vision Zero program, and, and looking if there's maybe some key locations where people are already crossing, maybe just running across the street, that we could put in some other infrastructure that would help make that easier. So looking at the bus network, if we look right around the site, there are currently four routes that are serving the campus site. So this is Route 80, 85, 88, and 90. And when the Green Line extension is put in, that's basically duplicating Route 80. And MBTA's plan currently is to do away with Route 80 because you've got duplicative service there with the Green Line. So we're going to be looking at the bus stops around the site where are people coming from and going to? Um, you can see these stops are actually really close together. So are there some that maybe aren't as needed? We can also look at ridership numbers and the details here aren't you know, hugely important right now, but could we consolidate some of these bus stops into one location if there's some that aren't being used that often? Another thing that MBTA is looking at is whether some of these sites would be better as what we call far side stops. So a lot of these right now, you're stopping as you come to the intersection. And a far side stop is where the bus stops on the far side, the, the opposite side of the intersection. And there's a number of operational um, benefits to doing that. Near side stops have benefits too. We're going to be looking at that. And again, to talk a little bit more, this is the near side stop, if this is the intersection. The near side stop, the buses are stopping as they get to the light, whereas the far side stop, they go through the light. And that works out great if you can time it such that the buses get there as the light is turning green and they can go through and then the light turns red. So there's some operational things there that could really um, help with the bus schedules. Um, but we also need to look at where are people going. If they really need to come to the campus site, then maybe those near side ones that are located right on the corner of the campus are better. So we'll be looking at ridership data and those sort of operational things to see, to work with MBTA and the city to see if there's any options for those. Uh, bicycling, this is the city's current bike network map. And you can see the project area there highlighted in red. If we look right around the campus, there are some neighbor ways that you see they're highlighted in the bright green. These are low volume streets that are comfortable for most people to ride on. Are there some needs that we might have here with crossing the street to get to the campus if you've come in on one of those neighbor ways? There's also some shared lane markings here in blue and on Highland Avenue. Um, those are the kind of treatments that are usually put in on low speed, low volume streets. Um, looking at what we can do to maybe enhance those connections. And then there's a bike lane on the uphill side on Medford Street. And the reason it's only on the uphill side is because if you're going down the hill, going north, it's easier to keep up with traffic and ride in the lane because you've got gravity on your side. Coming back up the hill, it's going to take a little bit more work, and so in that case, that's why there's a bike lane only going uphill, so cyclists have their own space there. 
And then uh, you had asked about the community path. That's this dotted purple line here. So that's going to be tying all of this together um, along with the green line extension to really help build out the bike network. So with all of these connectivity questions and maybe some access issues to get across the streets at places that aren't currently signalized, what are some of the items in our toolbox to make that an easier, uh, an easier transition? So we'll walk through each of these really briefly. These are some traffic calming and safety treatments that are commonly used in a lot of cities, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of these around, both in Somerville and around the rest of the area. So curb extensions, these are great. They shorten crossing distances, like you can see here. They can also help slow down traffic by visually narrowing the lane widths. Narrowing the travel lanes, this is another thing that naturally induces drivers to slow their speeds. Speed humps, uh, these, I'm sure you've seen these as well. They're just these raised areas that, you know, that, that vertical change also helps slow speeds down. Speed tables, there's sort of a combination of speed humps, and in this case, you'll see they've got the curb extensions in there as well. These can also be combined with crosswalks, so it really draws the driver's attention to anyone that's walking in that crosswalk space, as well as inducing them to slow their speeds. Speed cushions, these get the same results as speed tables and speed humps, but they're easier for fire trucks and large vehicles like buses to traverse because they can basically straddle the cushions. Um, they're also a little easier to deal with in terms of drainage. And then a couple of signalization options. These aren't full signals. These are what we call pedestrian hybrid signals. The uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, there's one of these down at Union Square um, at where Washington Street comes in. Um, and these are actuated, you push the button and then the lights start flashing and the cars are to yield to you. And then uh, a pedestrian hybrid beacon, this one is down by the highway um, by the stop and shop and it's, it was just recently put in by MassDOT. So you may have seen this one, it's fairly new. But the same kind of thing where instead of the flashing yellow lights that signal drivers to yield to someone in the stop in the crosswalk, the pedestrian hybrid beacons, you push the button and then it actually goes to a sequence of lighting schemes that ends up with a red, a red phase. So drivers have to stop. It's not a yielding situation anymore. So we would love to hear your thoughts. You all know this area very well, and I'm sure you deal with these situations every day. So our, your feedback, we'd love to have that and have that inform the decisions that come out of this process. We have what's a, called a wiki map. It's an online interactive map that you can go in and drop little pins and tell us what the issues are that you know in that spot. Um, we've got two different categories. We've got destinations, so we'd like to know where you're going. In this case, we're focusing right on the area around the campus, so what's in that blue square. So if you're coming to different spots on the campus site, if you're going to the library, you can drop a pin there to City Hall, so forth, and anything that's on the side streets as well. So if you're going to one of the businesses on Highland Avenue, this is a great place to let us know that you need access to that as well. Um, and then the orange dots, these are areas of concern. So places you know there's a problem you've dealt with that we should be aware of, and, aware of and take into consideration in this process. So you can link to this website. It's really easy to use um, through the project website. So if you just Google Somerville Central Hill Plan, it'll come up and there will be a link to this wiki map there. A couple other, other, other uh, data sources that we're going to be looking at. This is Somerville's Vision Zero website. And all of this heat map here, these are representing crashes that have happened in the area. Did you want to talk to this? Okay. Sure. So this is also online, and you can go to this map and zoom in and, and see what's happening on your street corner. Um, okay. Okay. And Mike's going to take over, and then we'll take questions. 
just a quick second here. Uh, so again, for those who weren't here earlier, I'm Mike Tremblay, Senior Transportation Planner for the city. Um, so Vision Zero is something we're doing this year. The goal is to eliminate all uh, traffic related to uh, serious injuries and fatalities in the city. Um, this map looks scary. Uh, it looks it look like there's destruction everywhere. These are just a, uh, this represents all the crashes that happened over the last five years. So there's a lot of cool data on that website, sanremoma.gov slash vision zero. There's also a very similar tool, Wikimap, uh, that was just discussed. It's not quite as high tech in, uh, and it's not quite as uh, fancy as the one you just saw. But if you have any um, safety related issues in the, in the whole city, we're happy to, um, you can drop a similar type of pin and, and let us know how that, uh, how those types of pins, how those types of issues uh, affect you. So uh, we're happy to get feedback there as well. And I also want everybody to take a look, keep a lookout for uh, similar types of public meetings like this one to talk about Vision Zero throughout the city. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's Vision Zero of my two minutes bill. And then um, I'll take this one if you don't mind either. So uh, the T is having this um, this better bus project. They're doing their service planning for the next uh, for the next decade or so, and that's happening now. So there's actually a meeting um, on June seventh down on Washington Street. Uh, I believe it's a Holiday Inn there, uh, and they're talking. They're, they're looking to get feedback on all the bus routes in and around the Somerville area. So if you have any qu uh, questions about how the Green Line extension affects bus routes, or uh, is there a way to make the, the Route 90 bus more efficient, for example? Um, those, are the place, those are the places they ask those types of questions. We work with the T's bus ops team all the time, so um, you can also ask us directly at, at the city staff. But uh, if you want to tell, talk, talk to the T directly about their bus uh, planning efforts, then that's the place to go to. That June 7th meeting is uh, next week. So. so with that, we'll take questions on the transportation topic. But you'll have to come up and use the mic like before. So Joel, you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you didn't discuss um, that everything, it looked really great, um, some of the things that you're looking at. And um, I was, a couple of questions were, um, is this actually going to happen with the high school project or like as it's built and done? And is um, uh, bike parking, uh, I was curious about the different types of bike parking. Um, that you're thinking about. Sure. So the first question was, is, are these projects going to be implemented as part of the high school project? And the second question was about bike parking. And we are planning to look at bike parking as part of this. Um, if you've got ideas about where you'd like to see it, that would be a great bit of information to drop on that wiki map. Um, so definitely we welcome that kind of feedback. And then I will let somebody else answer the question. about. So also just to add to the bike parking, the high school project will have bike parking. There'll be bike parking at the front of the high school. There's bike parking down at the field. And the GLX station is also planning on having bike parking right off the community path. So in addition to that. Yeah, so like I think when I say bike parking, it's not like a generic. So like there'll be something about different kinds of bike parking. So you want to have like for people who work at the high school, you'd want to have maybe indoor bike parking. Um, you know, the all the different types of park parking. Person who comes just for a little bit, person who's there for a little, you know, there's, there's a range. So I can tell you for the high school, we do not have, we have covered parking, but we do not have indoor parking. Um, I know the MBTA is looking at what their bike parking setup will be at the community path, and they haven't determined that yet. And then um, a part of the campus plan, we will look at where bike parking can be on the campus and the different types of it. So part of our campus planning effort will investigate different types of bike parking. Your first question was, will this happen with the high school? The answer is no. The planning will be done by the end of this year. The hope is then to start to understand with the city schedule when things can be implemented. The 1895 building will not be vacated until the final phase of the high school project. So once that's vacated, there's an opportunity to go in then, if there's a program in place, to go in and renovate that building and have a plan for who's going to move in there. So the city is looking at different uses for that building because the school department is moving out of it and it will no longer be a school department or a school building. No, I, I meant the transportation. Oh, you meant specific to transportation. Um, I, I think there's opportunities that things could be implemented as part of when, for when the high school is complete, depending upon the outcome of the campus planning and what is promoted, um, I think there are different opportunities for that. Yeah, I think part of that's going to depend on what it is that's determined, you know, would help with access. So crosswalks, you know, if we're adding those in, just in terms of infrastructure costs, those are fairly 
cost effective. Um, if we were to look at some of these signalization options, like the pedestrian hybrid beacon, not saying that that's needed, but if something like that um, extensive did come up as a good solution, those obviously require quite a bit more resources. Um, and so that would then become the next phase of that discussion. So it, it really depends on the magnitude of, of the changes that would be made. I'll, I'll add to that as well. Um, so the city has a comprehensive paving plan that looks ahead five years. And I believe, and don't quote me on this, I believe Highland Ave is um, scheduled for either 20, 2019 or 2020 for a repave. And I have to double check on the exact bounds of those. I'm pretty sure that includes in front of the high school, but that would be a good opportunity to think about new crosswalks, for example, because as part of the repaving process, we also do the sidewalks. So that's when you want to do any curb work, any ramp work that you would require work with crosswalks and things like that. So as opportunities come up to implement parts of these plan, and it might some things might be immediately, some things might be three years, some things might be five or ten years, or I don't know, depending on the, the like 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 we said, uh, the the magnitude of the uh, improvement. Uh, they'll be implemented as, you know, as um, practical, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. You didn't, there didn't seem to be a crosswalk on Medford Street near the subway, near the new subway station. It was at the beginning and at the end of the high school, and that's all. That seems to be very dangerous. Subway stations cause people to walk more, walk more across the street. That is true, and as part of this, we'll be looking at what MBTA's site plan is for that. It's entirely likely that if there where Pearl comes in, they would be doing improvements at that site for access for the site. I, I would imagine that was part of that. And they are adding, they are adding a crosswalk across Medford Street where the community path crosses over. Okay, and, and they are adding another crosswalk at the community path where it would cross over Medford. That's the path. The truth is the subway station is half a mile further along, and the subway station needs, needs a crosswalk more than yeah, that's something we'd be working with MBTA on as we move forward. You had a question? Yes, I think it's fantastic that the campus plans that you are more holistic look at the transportation connection. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think that's really important. One is coming in from the community path, one is lucky, but one is coming from the pilot path by bike, as I would. There really is no provision to do that currently at Highland Ave or School Street or Walnut Street, really any. Definitely. So the question was, the, the, the community path would be providing access from the back side of the site or from the, 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 the north side of the site. What kind of access opportunities would be looked at as part of Highland Avenue access to the site by bike, by foot, by all these other modes? That's definitely part of what we're looking at here. Um, part of that would be looking at how traffic is flowing through these parking areas and can we section off part of that for bike access. Um, what is the state of the sidewalks in that area? Um, those sort of finer grain details of what's going to happen for the site as a whole. Yeah, we're in the early stages right now, so as we move forward, that'll those conversations will take more shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd say uh, the question was what level of detail to ask for in the wiki map when you're identifying access issues. I'd say put every, put all your thoughts in there because it all comes back as feedback as part of that when we download that data, it'll all be captured. So put your, put your wish list and, and we'll be working with the city to, to figure out how that can all come together. Any other questions about transportation? <laughs> yes, sir. I just want to share with folks, I'm appointed to the community working group for Green Line Extension as the Dillon Square Station Area Rep. Um, my name is Justin Mailing. If folks want to talk about the Gilman Square Station, I'm happy to talk to folks after this. I don't want to derail your conversation at all. Um, but if I can be helpful in helping people get those questions answered, I'm happy to do that. 
And, and if anyone didn't hear him, he was saying that he's the local rep to the Green Line Extensions Community uh, uh, Point Group. Uh, um, and if anyone has questions about the Gilman Square Station in particular, he's happy to talk about that after the meeting. So you can seek out the gentleman in the yellow checkered shirt. All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So School Street, is it going to, like, are you going to try to do one way or two ways, or is that the whole, like, I have to go um, So the question was one weighing or two weighing School Street, and is that on the table, um, or can it be input into the wiki map? I would definitely welcome your input on that. It's been talked about as a potential solution. Um, there may be some space constraints through there, depending on what's going on with pickups and drop-offs on the school side of School Street. Um, but if you've got strong opinions or even not strong opinions, um, one way, but maybe have like actual lanes. A lot of people like like to go left, uh -huh. and, and then it's backed up all the way down into like Market Street. Sure. And uh, it gets really congested. So her comment was better defining the uses of space on School Street, a preference to keep it one way, um, and then some ideas about crossings. That's exactly the kind of input we need on the wiki map. So if you could go and, and yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be taking all that into consideration. So thanks. Yes. Um, I don't know that we've determined when to take it down. I w usually they're up for six or eight weeks, um, but Kristen can probably answer that better. Hi, so if you came after the introductions, I'm Kristen Stelgis. I'm the project manager for the city for this. And we'll be keeping it open for several months, probably. Um, so as long as you're able and tell your neighbors, the more input we can get, um, as we continue to refine our ideas around this, the better. So please keep your comments coming. Okay, any other transportation questions? Yes. For folks that are not technically savvy, how can folks access the wall work? So you, I, you'll probably see it on a slide later. You can, and you'll see that there's a website. Um, so it's somervillema.gov slash central hill plan. There's a way to give comment on that page. Um, it's also where you can access the wiki map. And you can also email central hill at somervillema.gov. Any thoughts, questions, ideas you have, and we'll make sure to get back to you that way too. So if somebody then the, the easiest way to remember how to do that is to call 311 and say, I have a question about the Central Hill Campus Plan. Um, I could tell you my phone number, but it's much easier to remember 311. <laughs> Any other questions about transportation? All right, well, Great. Thank you all. So we'll be moving on to sustainability. Good evening. Again, my name is Liz Galloway, sustainable designer with SMMA. Um, I've been working on the high school project, um, supporting the incorporation of sustainable design uh, into that building and also leading up the uh, LEED certification process. Um, the project is targeting LEED for Schools Silver under version 4. Um, we're going to be incorporating measures um, that touch on all of these credit categories from energy, water, uh, site, indoor environmental quality, and building materials. Um, but tonight we wanted to talk a little bit about um, energy and water and how this kind of translates into the campus planning process. So I'm going to turn it over to Erin Pastilio, civil engineer, and she's going to talk a little bit about stormwater to get us started. Thanks, Liz. So um, as Liz said, I'm Erin Prestilio. I'm a civil engineer with SMMA. I've been working on the high school project since we began design almost three years ago. 
Um, I first wanted to start by saying that I care about stormwater, not just because I'm a civil engineer, but because it impacts us all. Uh, maybe not every day, like we drive to work or to school, but I have to imagine everyone in this room has been impacted by um, you know, flooding in a street, trying to navigate roads or sidewalks. I know I have a sump pump in my basement at home. So, you know, stormwater is important to me. It's important to the city. Um, so I just wanted to begin with that. Um, so again, I've been working on the Somerville High School design since, since we began. Um, overall, the goal for stormwater when we, when we design um, components of it is really to slow uh, the time it takes from stormwater from falling out, uh, out of the sky and getting into the infrastructure in the streets. So on the high school project, we have, um, we've done that using a variety of techniques on the school project. Um, the first it highlighted on the plan is green roofs. So green roofs, obviously, it takes time for rain um, to fall across the vegetation, through the soil. Eventually, it will be captured in the plumbing system. But again, it's all about slowing the time it takes um, the rainfall to get to the city's infrastructure. Um, we have three... Um, rainwater harvesting tanks, um, two larger tanks below ground, one smaller tank above ground, about 50,000 gallons, um, that'll capture nearly all of the high school roof runoff. Um, and that water will be used to um, supplement irrigation supply for the lawns off Highland Ave. Uh, we also have porous pavement within the vehicular driveways off Highland Ave. Um, these pavers will look like, um, from the surface, any other pavement that we are proposing on the high school project, but what really makes a difference here is that, again, it allows rainwater to um, flow through the pavers into the stone below and then to potentially um, drain through the soil um, below. We also have a variety of infiltration systems. These are below grade, you know, so you won't gonna, you're not going to see them, but they're below grade structures. Again, um, slowing the time it takes for rainfall to get to city infrastructure and also allowing opportunities for rainwater to get into the ground instead of, you know, typically, and as they do today, the rainwater flows right off pavement into drainage structures and then flies to the combined sewers in the streets. Sorry, if you can go to the next one. So, so for the campus plan, we're looking really to expand these systems. Um, we've designed them as part of the high school project to be easily expanded upon, so we can easily expand um, the porous pavement that we have. Um, we can add on and include more in below ground infiltration systems. We could look at um, additional green roofs, rainwater harvesting for irrigation or alternative uses. Um, we're also targeting um, and looking at improving water quality as it um, discharges from the site. So these are kind of our initial ideas as far as stormwater goes for sustainability and for the campus plan. Thanks, Erin. So continuing along that thought, um, we really were taking a holistic look at water as part of the high school design, thinking about... Um, water efficiency in terms of limiting the amount of potable water that we would need through efficient fixtures, um, Energy Star appliances like the dishwashers that are going to be in the kitchens. Um, on the site, uh, selecting native and adaptive plant species that don't need as much water for irrigation, uh, using efficient irrigation systems, and then, as Erin was mentioning, um, offsetting some of that potable water use by capturing the, the rainwater from the roof. And as we um, look at expanding that to the um, campus plan, we're kind of taking a similar sort of approach, thinking about um, looking at alternative water sources and how we can use them on the site to make water more efficient in terms of um, the, the future buildings and, and other site activities. On the energy efficiency side, we've incorporated several measures to reduce the energy footprint of the building, um, including a robust building enclosure, um, cool roof that's also PV ready. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, later on. Um, LED lighting with advanced uh, network controls, uh, dedicated outdoor air systems with a green cooling system. So we're bringing in 100% uh, fresh outdoor air. The cooling system that we've designed allows us to provide thermally comfortable spaces that uses um, about 40% less energy than a traditional full cooling system for the classroom spaces. High efficiency chiller and condensing boilers to provide uh, that cooling and heating. 
um, as well as um, condensing hot water heaters and Energy Star equipment in both the teaching kitchens and then the, um, the main kitchen for the high school. This is just to share a little bit of the kind of analysis that went into the design of the high school building. We were looking at um, the design of a, a trellis system on the outside of the south facing um, classrooms and really look to optimize it so that we're limiting the amount of glare that's coming into the space while maintaining a high level of quality daylighting. And this goes hand in hand also with limiting heat gain in those spaces. So again, supporting um, creating space classrooms that are thermally comfortable and reducing the amount of heat needed for cooling. I mentioned the PV ready roof. There's a couple of things that went into this. One, we were really being thoughtful and planning out where we were gonna put our rooftop equipment to try to preserve as much open area um, to allow um, photovoltaic panels to be installed in the future. Um, we also designed the structure to support that additional weight of PV panels and there's um, conduit to allow those to be connected to the electric system in the future. So what does all this mean in terms of the city's goal of being carbon neutral by 2050? Uh, this graph um, shows the carbon footprint for the existing building and compares it to what we're um, estimating uh, based on the current modeling that we've done for the new high school. Um, this gray bar represents um, heating that's associated with um, the oil consumption on the site. Uh, there's a little bar here for natural gas, and then this is um, electricity used for the current building. Um, and then under the proposed building, this is a natural gas used for heating and the kitchen, um, and then electric use that's projected. So I want to talk a little bit about comparing the, this gray bar to the orange bar. So we're really able to uh, significantly reduce the amount of emissions associated with heating for a couple of reasons. One, um, natural gas is a much cleaner and lower carbon uh, content fuel than oil is, which is what is currently being used. Also, we're going to be designing a lot more robust building enclosure and using much more efficient heating systems. So we're really able to um, reduce the emissions associated with the heating component. Um, now, you'll notice that the blue bar gets bigger, and it's not necessarily that the building is going to be less efficient, but we're providing a lot more energy services with the new high school design. Um, right now, um, you know, we're we're relying on some, you know, leakage through the air, through the enclosure for um, providing fresh air. And we're going to instead, under the new school, be providing ventilation with air handling units. And there's energy associated with using those, those fans to bring in the air to the building. Also, we're adding cooling. So that's going to, um, that's going to use a lot more energy on the electric side. But when you think about the opportunity for um, the future addition of PV that I mentioned with the PV ready roof, um, one of the strategies that net zero energy buildings use is all electric based systems. And what that allows you to do is to easily offset your energy use. So between the rooftop PV and the potential to purchase green power, that bar can be offset. So we've taken a big step from the existing building design towards that um, carbon neutral goal with the proposed high school. And then as part of the campus plan, we're gonna be thinking about uh, um, in you know 25 years or so when you need to be doing upgrades to that high school, um, you know, how do we um, manage the remaining bar that's there? So we've talked about um, this equation a little bit in terms of the context of the high school. We're going to be thinking about that also in terms of the library and the 1895 building and City Hall as part of the campus plan, and then also thinking about some other energy uses on the site, like site lighting, electric vehicle charging, and how does all this fit into this uh, goal of being carbon neutral in 2050? Um, so just to kind of summarize some of the things that um, we've been thinking about, uh, on the stormwater management side, looking at expanding opportunities for porous pavement and infiltration um, and uh, rainwater harvesting. Um, on the building enclosure side, um, looking at how do we make those uh, buildings really energy efficient and sort of creating a plan to guide them towards being um, a part of that carbon neutral uh, campus in the future. Uh, we're going to look at um, campus-based energy systems versus individual building systems and are there opportunities there for greater efficiency of one versus the other. Similarly, um, you know, look at all electric systems versus, you know, do we look at something that ha uses natural gas now that can be converted to a renewable-based biogas in the future? 
Um, on the renewable energy side, we'll be considering how do we integrate things like solar photovoltaic or solar thermal, um, potentially wind or ground source heat pumps or combined heat and power system. So these are all things that we're kind of thinking about, but we're really looking to hear from you if there's any of this in particular that resonates with you, if you have other ideas of things that we should be considering. Today, I'm not scared of the microphone. Um, so when you were talking about sustainability, you were kind of in part talking about it uh, in a lens of carbon neutrality, uh, except when it came to a teeny bit of uh, green roofing for only for mitigating water flow. Uh, and I was wondering about how you balance those priorities because one of the things that's happening with expanding the footprint of the high school is that we're, and some of the other changes to the hill is that we're learning, we're losing some urban wild space and um, and we only have so much more areas for green space. So I was wondering how you balance what happens on the roof in that equation. So like why isn't there more green roof or what else can you, what other metrics do you use besides carbon neutrality as a way to measure sustainability? Well, that's sort of a, that last part is kind of a broad question. There's lots of other ways to look at sustainability. Um, <clears throat> And as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, there's a lot more that's gone into the, the thought of the high school um, about that. I, I don't yeah. I think if you look at the, the plan of on the left over there of what the high school project is today, I, I understand people may feel that the urban wild is a great space, but nobody goes back there. But if you look at what the, the campus could be, I think there are a lot more opportunities for green open space and for usable green open space in the future. So it is, it is hard whenever you, know, you cut down trees and people think that there's a loss of space. But if, I think if you look at this campus plan in the future, you're gonna have a lot more opportunities for green open space and usable green open space. Picnics on the lawn, you know, porch fest, a food fest in the back. Things that weren't thought about previously, drawing people to this site. So, so I, I understand the... I, I didn't want, don't worry, I have questions about green and open space. But I also know that when we sometimes talk about open space, we, we're talking about uh, a fake green, a painted green sports field. So uh, I'm, I would love to say that to the landscaping okay. the conversation. I was really talking about, the, the, what I heard was we had very specific charts where we had carbon neutrality and it was very specific to that measure. And that didn't quite uh, reflect how I saw the roofs being parceled out for different uses. Uh, obviously, I, you also were thinking about glare, and you're thinking about how you're using power in different ways, but I was kind of wondering about thinking that goes into balancing other measures that you use to balance how much uh, space is going to be allotted for PV versus uh, green roofs. Does that make sense? So, so the question was really about, I think, about the use of the roof. Are we maximizing in an urban environment uh, that that? I will try to go back to that roof plan. So, Aaron and uh, um, Liz were really highlighting a very important point. The why don't you go to that image you just had? Actually, the, the roof well, plan. yeah, perfect. Yeah, hopefully you can see all the white boxes on the roof. The complexity of the high school. And the fact that we have condensed the footprint, so we, we are stacking the programs in order to save site space and to actually gain or mitigate it. Don't forget, the 1895 building is not part of the high school anymore, so that footprint will be a city uh, program building. But all these uh, air uh, exchange uh, boxes on top of the roof is a way to save space on the rest of the site uh, because of the numbers of programs that we're actually running throughout the school. You've got two kitchens uh, in the building. You've got multiple CTE programs that need all kinds of air changes. So we really were working very hard to maximize. The city actually invested in uh, adding structure to the existing uh, roof framing for the field house so that we could accommodate as much PV 
uh, in that sustainability equation as well. Uh, just want to elaborate that we actually have about four or five green roof components of the building. There's the central courtyard, which uh, is an educational program space at the heart of the school, but up on the third floor. Uh, we have an outdoor roof terrace for the electricity program, which is one of the CT programs. Kids up there will be working on photovoltaics, so actually hands-on learning environments for wind, uh, solar thermal, and PV. And then there's an outdoor dining uh, space that you can't see. That's a, it's a roofscape, but it is a covered roofscape that's actually underneath that triangular portion. And then at the very front, underneath that image that we had shared with you early on, uh, there's sort of a, a porch-like element underneath that uh, uh, lecture hall space. And then, of course, you've got the two green roofs that are at the front that are um, also going to be more effective for the stormwater piece. So we have tried to actually make uh, maximum use of every square foot uh, that the city has given us for the school. The two small green roofs you have in front were the only two that looked like green roofs in the design that you showed us the first time. So the question is, how much, what is the percentage of green roof that is in your plan? I have a second question to you. I don't think we actually ever calculated that, did you? Uh, the question was how much as a percentage of roof area was green roof. Uh, and so, yes, we did look at it two ways. We have pavers and we have uh, a green space, open space in that internal courtyard area. Others are more hardscape green space, which improves the thermal capacity and, and uh, aspect. They may not be helping the stormwater, per se. <laughs> so, so we did do a mixture, and hopefully that's part of the learning environment, right? We are providing a variety of different uh, landscapes across the building. Uh, the question is, what are we doing with the PV panels on the existing building? Are you They're being removed and returned to the city for use somewhere else. They're quite old, I think. Yeah, they are quite old. Technology has changed so quickly with solar panels. Sure. So, in your water mitigation map, you've had a lot of things right around the building. There have been several years in Somerville where the spring sports season has been delayed because the fields were too wet to be used. What's going to happen on that field to make it usable as early as possible? So the question was asking um, how we're going to accommodate uh, the spring um, season, which typically brings um, wetness to traditional turf fields. Um, so the field we're proposing as part of the high school project will be synthetic turf. Um, the, the huge benefits of synthetic turf um, are that it can extend playing seasons and that it, it can be kept dry. So the, the turf also comes complete with a drainage system below so that it won't have problems of flooding and dampness and, and, and all of that. How does, I just don't know, how does synthetic turf break? Uh, similar to natural turf and that the, um, there's a collection system below, um, below the, the grass that you see above um, at grade um, and the water's captured and... Um, I put a tarp on my yard. Yep. It's only going to drain around the very edges. It's not a tarp. Yeah, it... it, it, it it's, it's not a top. It's not pavement. Um, it, it allows the rainwater to go through the, the turf. Um, and then there's collection systems below. Yep, it, it, it's not, it's not, it's not a, a tarp. Yep. Uh, I, I don't recall if there's a specific uh, need goal for the high school. Uh, uh, if there is, what's the specific uh, site boundary for the high school? Sure. So the, there was two questions. I, uh, the first was asking what the lead boundary is for the high school project. And then the second question was, uh, what is the lead goal for the campus? Is that right? So the lead boundary for the high school project is essentially... Um, it, it, it's on the board. It essentially excludes the corners of City Hall in 1895 and the library. Essentially portions of the site which we will not touch. Yep. Sure. So it's... it's everything colored. It, it's everything colored. Which, so it will include 
this, it will not include this building, it will include the portion of the drive we're reconstructing across Highland and then up to Medford. It will not include kind of these areas grayed out because they're still, they haven't been designed yet. Not part of a high school project. The, the goal is lead silver for the campus. For the high I'm sorry for the high school. The, the lead um, goals haven't been established for the campus yet. And I, I just have one more question. Um, you had uh, mentioned areas that, that are uh, uh, opportunities for photovoltaics. I, I was just wondering what that means specifically and, and why those aren't, aren't, aren't currently So you're referring to the high school or for the campus plan? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So the, you were asking about uh, why the uh, solar panels for the high school are not included as part of the project. You mentioned there was opportunities for... Sure. We, we were designing for that to be designed, for, to be installed in the future. But um, my understanding is that... The simple answer is the high school project can't afford doing solar panels on a roof. The state reimburses up to a certain percentage of, of cost. The city has to kick in the rest. Um, the dollars don't stretch far enough to get the educational program that's needed and the PV on the roof. And in working with the city, there's definitely a goal for the city to understand how to get that as part of a city project, but not part of the high school project. Um, sorry, say... Yeah, I mean, so, so the question is, have we looked into a third party? We haven't, as the high school team, have not looked into a third party, but the campus planning team can do that. Our Genziano, for example, was designed PV ready, and the city put panels on that after the fact. So we want to make sure that everything is in place for the city to do that when they, when they have that opportunity. Any other questions? We have about eight more minutes till we start our next segment. Yes, sir. It's not a question, but just a comment. My name is Andrew Kopach. Um, I spent a lot of time behind the high school in the woods. Um, uh, I mountain bike back there. I put in trails back there. You know, what I saw was owls, hawks, deer, coyote. Well, they slew of other things. They're smaller. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they follow the commuter rail track up, and I follow the commuter rail track. That's the basis point for me. This is, seems like it's going to be a great project and I support it. Yet, there was a urban forest back there that's no longer, and it wasn't needed to be just used by humans. Something else was used. I was one of the few humans, including I was sleeping back there, I'm probably one of the few people that doesn't have an apartment. I looked for all these strips of woods. That was one of them. That was an excellent area to walk dogs. I know it had to go, but it was useful the way it was on its own. So, thank you. We have about five more minutes. Do we want to start early or do we want to? We can close enough. We'll start early. Okay. So. Hi, for those of you that might have walked in later, my name is Samantha Farrell, as well as my associate, Laura Moniz. Um, we're both landscape architects on the project, so we'll be talking about the landscape design and planning elements that are associated with this site. So a couple of these slides are repeats. Um, like I said, some people might have just walked in. So what we'll be focusing on for the landscape design and planning opportunities on site is really highlighted in the pink on the plan. Um, the high school project, we've gone over that boundary. It will overlap with the high school project in areas along Highland and to the north along the GLX. Um, but a large area that we're looking for in this um, Campus Hill plan is going to be the, the library site as well as the 1895 and um, City Hall. When we had started this project, um, like I had mentioned earlier, we planned a, a master plan idea for the high school site. So all of these images are from that high school master plan. But there was um, a great need from the city and a, a great idea uh, to allow the high school to 
reside on the eastern side of the site, allowing um, the connection to GLX and Gilman Square and really opening up the site for view sheds and pedestrian access. It creates a permeability permeability on site um, that allows different types of uses and really um, opens up the back side of the site, which is right now uh, more of a back of house feeling. Um, so we're able to engage the northern side of the site as well as the southern side of the site and have through lines um, on the majority of the project. With this, it started to dictate a couple different cores. We've developed a campus organization as we've shifted the high school over to the east. We have a civic core that's focused on the city hall, 1895 building, as well as the community entrance for the high school, and then the academic core that's focused on the main entrance for the high school, as well as the library, associated outdoor classrooms and playground spaces. So what we're going to look at are the programming opportunities uh, for these open spaces. In the Civic Corps, uh, we have opportunities for to um, expand and improve the Civic Plaza near City Hall in the 1895 building. And what we want to do there is, you know, study whether should this space really engage the buildings, should it engage Highland Ave, um, perhaps it's both. Um, and what we want this space also to do is to be um, a large enough paved area to accommodate uh, some of the activities that happen uh, on campus, but also be able to navigate pedestrians and vehicular traffic, bike traffic, all the circulation needs, um, and also keep those uh, modes of transportation out of conflict. Um, and we also want to maintain as much green space as possible, so we have to find that balance. Um, again, some events that happen here are some rallies, dedications, and ceremonies that gather quite a crowd and we want to be able to accommodate that, continue to accommodate that. As well as events like the tree and menorah lighting, um, some performances and other celebrations, perhaps spring cleanups, all those types of community events that happen here at uh, City Hall. And as we discussed, the play field to the northwest of the site that is part of the uh, high school project is not in our scope for design, but is in our scope for programming opportunities. And so those things, again, um, naturally we would think of the organized sports, but we want also to be open to the community for just general recreation. Come over with your families to play frisbee or catch. Um, perhaps, um, you know, there are programs for boot camp or yoga classes. Um, and again, as an extension of the Civic Plaza, by proximity, it can be a space to also host and um, accommodate some of those festivals and uh, you know other um, events going on, with the caveat that the field also, we can only put so much of types of program there. We, we have to keep the field from not being damaged, i.e. we can't put up tents and poke holes into the field as you could with natural turf. But it's still an open space that could be used for those types of uh, programs. Another component that we'll be taking into consideration are the monuments. Um, and that's going to be discussed in more detail after this uh, segment, but I just want to mention that there are existing monuments on campus. Uh, some will be staying, some may or may not, may stay or may go, um, and those, again, that'll be discussed further. For those monuments that stay, uh, we will be looking to incorporate them into a zone along Highland Ave, and that zone will tie the, um, here, some of the monuments, uh, but that zone will um, tie the civic core and the academic core together in a uh, cohesive fashion, again, helping define the campus edges, giving it identity, and making uh, a nice green space opportunities for the campus. Oh, on the um, academic core side, we have programming opportunities for the high school entry plaza, the playgrounds, and the library green. So we're going to look at the library green first, and 
we will, again, we, it's going to be a balance of active and passive spaces and um, some smaller hardscape plaza type spaces, but maintaining uh, a lot more green open space. And so w the types of activities we want to be able to accommodate there are, you know, hangout spaces, whether it's having a lunch with your book, cup of coffee, um, either by yourself or maybe a small group. We know the teens come over from high school. Um, children come in with daycare groups, etc. So we want to provide open, um, flexible space for whatever types of activities to happen there. Um, continue to hold events like the movie nights, again, as been mentioned, Porch Fest, etc. Or even consider some other opportunities like temporary art exhibits or maybe a book fair. Looking to other programming opportunities on Central Hill on the eastern loop along the academic zone. Um, playgrounds are a special piece. I, I I have a special place for them in my heart. I like to design them. I'm a CPSI, Certified Playground Safety Inspector. So it's um, an element that we take very seriously and that we're excited to have as part of this Campus Hill Master Plan. Um, the playground that resides on Central Hill currently is a two to five and five to 12 age playground. We will be replacing it. Um, this master plan is studying where it will go and what types of activities and elements will be there. As part of the high school uh, project, we have a childcare playground that's located um, on the eastern side of the school. It's really for that child care program. So it's thinking about their educational needs. Uh, it's free play. Um, it has some different natural elements in it. It will be open to the public after school hours, but during the program's operational hours, it will be specifically for that child care program. Looking to the Central Hill Playground, um, these are just some is inspiration images. Again, they have a, a two to five and a five to 12 um, playground facility on the current campus. And um, these are just some different ideas of utilizing urban materials, metals and concretes. Um, Chucky e. Harris is a great park. It's a great case study, um, what you like or what you don't like. So we wanna hear feedback from the community as to, again, um, what activities you like to see there and your uh, feelings on the location of that playground. We're gonna jump to the high school entry plaza and a lot of the associated materiality and spaces. Um, the front entry plaza is going to be a very pedestrian oriented zone. So it'll utilize a, a sea of pavers. It won't be um, your typical asphalt and concrete systems that are seen in a lot of vehicular zones. So the paver system will lend itself well to a pedestrian feel um, with different bollards and curb cuts allowing us to define the pedestrian versus vehicular zones. Gathering spaces on site, we've developed um, a sunken garden, an outdoor classroom. This is a very topographic site, so there's a lot of change in the contours from the top to the bottom, and some of those spaces we want to utilize those contours to develop amphitheaters, um, outdoor seating, gathering spaces to encourage the community to utilize these areas. Along Medford Street, we're um, activating this space with different types of um, parkour elements. We had actually worked with a community member from Somerville to develop this, as well as outdoor um, workout facilities. So this will be a linear park system along Medford Street to, again, activate that side, which has um, consistently been underutilized. Different campus gateways. Um, as we're activating that Medford Street side and we're adding GLX to the northern side of the site, we're now introducing new gateways to the campus. Um, we're looking at, again, this GLX connection, um, the stairway up, and then again, you can take the stairway all the way through to the Highland side. So instead of having to traverse the site and go all the way around, you're able to cut through the site and have that permeability on multiple areas of the site. Um, along with the eastern side of the site. And um, we've talked about, so this would be proposed for the campus plan on the western side, along with City Hall, different ways of accessibility and making sure we're taking into account all different types of um, modes and accessibility needs. With that, um, different gateways and new entry points, we're thinking of site 
um, wayfinding and environmental graphics. This was for the interior of the building, but um, our graphics team had worked on Somerville specific graphics. Um, it's hard to see, but we have Honk and Porch Fest on here. So the elements that we want to develop on site are Somerville specific, helping to um, define those new entry points and give this a sense of place on the site and allowing people to enter the site and understand where they are and where they want to go. Um, the streetscape edge is also kind of part of that gateway network. It's the connective tissue between the neighborhoods and the campus. So we're looking at um, we're looking at summer or School Street. We're looking at Highland, Walnut, and the length of Medford. What we've done on on the high school side of the project is start to develop a singular type of pedestrian lighting system. So this um, lowers the the feel of the lighting level. Um, the current campus has multiple different types of light heads, and we'd like to start a family of lighting so that it feels like a cohesive um, campus and it provides a unity in the lighting level and familiarity with um, the different materials similar to the tree palette. So these are both elements that address the streetscape. Um, we worked with Vanessa Bukili on de developing a diversity in our tree palette, um, trying to keep in mind uh, a variety of trees, shrubs, grasses. Um, although it has been reduced, there's still a northern side of the site that we would like to naturalize um, and keep as, as somewhat of an urban wild, um, with the rest of the site starting to develop an alley of trees, making sure there's a lot of shade to reduce the, the urban heat island effect. And with that, we will open it up for discussion. So. I've been waiting to hear about this since you guys were talking about the massing study done a long time ago. So I'm very excited. Um, I, I'm very excited about all the hard, th hard thinking that you've put into this. I agree the existing urban wild is not, probably not endemic trees, it's not very inviting. And I really look forward um, to having native plantings that can be more useful. And, and one of the things that I think about for my own youth is, be, um, what did we do? We actually c canoed to in Concord along the river and then got to the, the bridge. And right behind it, the rhododendrons. And as children, we'd play in the rhododendrons. And when I think about uh, maybe not urban, but, but uh, plantings that are inviting and intimate, that's one of the thoughts I return to. And so the idea that maybe on the north side that some of the plantings can be thought of in that way and not just rows of trees is, is something that I'm really excited about. It can make, can retain some of the idea that we had around our urban wild and actually deliver on it. Um, that was my first thing. The second thing is, um, so there are a good number of months of the year where we are not out and about so much. But one of the things that we do on, uh, on this campus is we do go there to go sledding. It's one of the few times I get to meet my neighbors and it's not directly addressed in the pink areas that you guys were highlighting, but I really worry in all the planning that you guys do around the library and the high school, that, that narrow corridor, it's not even, it's a really hard landing when you land into that parking lot, but off the curb, but that's where I meet my neighbors, that's where, uh, my nephews get to have that really wonderful classic New England experience. And um, every time you show wonderful um, stairways or grading, and I always, I'm like, what is gonna happen to that sledding area? Because if it goes away, I don't, there's no other place for us to go. Um, and so I hope you can find a way to keep that around. Also, it's very hard to tell if that is flattened or what, I don't, I don't actually know. Uh, and the third thing is, just like I said, uh, if something goes away, I don't know what'll happen. Um, I, we don't have any green space in Somerville. And so every, every uh, seating area, every monument you rebuild, every playground, I'm counting square feet. I'm wondering how are we going to meet the goals of Summer Vision 2030 um, or 2020, or whatever, whenever summer vision, I want it to be sooner than, than it is, so 2018, let's do it already. Um, but, I, like, I worry about that, and I know that one of the things that I worry about also is that there are, 
from my knowledge, and you please correct me, there are no specific goals about how this project should uh, per b by uh, there's no goals as to how much this should work towards some revision. So no one said, hey, this is how much square feet that we have, how much do we have to actually keep green in order to have our goals met? Um, and that's something that worries me. And it also, um, I don't know if it informs your decision making as, as much as it worries me. Um, you're obviously worried about a lot of other things that I don't have to worry about. Um, but that is a thing that, that weighs on me and I would, I impress upon it uh, on you uh, as well. Um, those are my three things. I, I'd love to hear something. I see you taking notes, so I'm happy That's about that. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have Melissa address the last one. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Summer Vision, our long-range plan, uh, one of the uh, numbers goal in that is to create 125 uh, new acres of open space by 2030. And that's a very ambitious goal. Um, and it's going to be difficult to achieve. Um, but part of my job in long-range planning is to uh, get us closer um, in every neighborhood plan and in the actions that we're doing as a city, uh, setting a direction forward, uh, earmark uh, places for new open space. And although um, this campus plan is trying to create more open space, I think um, as currently with the high school project starting underway um, and engaging in this process, there will be more landscaped area on the site than currently exists. Um, you know, being in City Hall every day, um, the concourse is the most underutilized piece of grass in Somerville. I will say it, I'm here all the time, no one uses it. Occasionally I see people playing frisbee on it. So I'm really looking forward to the idea of getting more people to Central Hill. Um, but uh, there's two neighborhood plans that Central Hill is stitching together, and that's the Union Square Neighborhood Plan and the Gilman Square Neighborhood Plan, and both of those lay out uh, new open space. Um, so uh, the last opportunity that the high school project brings is the um, having the 1895 building available after construction of the high school. Uh, there's the opportunity to bring more city services and co that locate them all together on the campus, and that would free other uh, currently city-owned assets for the potential for new, new open space. So uh, there's only so much you can fit on one site. Uh, the roadway network is sort of set, and the open space will not likely be expanding outward, but um, I hear your concern, and we're working towards achieving that goal every day. Uh, were there other two questions? So, sorry, one second. Will I answer the sled question? Um, in the interim, uh, before we develop the master plan on the western side, um, this space, and it probably shows on the board over there, will be a significant slope that will just be an open slope. So, in the interim, there will definitely be a sled hill there. Um, I think that something that we can look into and see where there are opportunities on the campus master plan campus plan um, to develop sled hills and utilize the topography so that we can have activities in winter as well. I appreciate that comment. Yes, of course. The, last one was just the, trees, but I think that's more of a the first the first comment was the trees, but that was just more of a statement. Was there anything that you were looking to hear back on that? I mean, if, if you have, you talked to Vanessa, if you had any specific thoughts around what that might look like on the set, <laughs> Sure. Um, Vanessa and I had done a site walk uh, on the northern side of the site. We had also talked about a lot of the existing trees. Um, we developed the, the overall planting plan along um, a lot of the parameters she set up for the city, so trees that do well in an urban setting. Um, and then on the northern side of the site, it was um, trees that are very native, different types of shrubs. So again, we're naturalizing that slope. Um, but along Highland, that's much more of an LA, a formal feel, especially with the memorials, if they say and go. Um, there's a, a civic and an academic side of the site that we are using as a forward-facing element. And the trees on the northern side are much more naturalistic. Yes. Uh, in the middle. Uh, so I see a number of my neighbors here from uh, the Winter Hill or other northern 
the side of the city. So uh, it's great to see this project uh, reorienting the, the weight of this plaza to reflect both the north and south sides of the city. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the Medford Street and Walnut Street accesses? I, I was really interested in this meeting, uh, and I won't see it on any of the designs here, that there was a uh, speculative addition to the library. I came in late, so I don't know if that's part of the conversation, but something I was really interested in for this meeting, but I didn't see it on the agenda. Nevertheless, uh, I'm particularly interested in, as far as this part of the conversation, um, how uh, we would have some flow coming from, uh, folks coming from the north, so that there would be some uh, access to what looks like a, uh, a loading ramp uh, to the, the high school uh, from Medford Street, that parkour path, which sounds amazing, uh, and other uh, access loops from, uh, from Walnut to get to either the library space or to the high school and the closet area. Okay. Um... So the question, yeah, I'm going to try and synthesize. Um, so the Winter Hill neighbors are looking at the access from Medford and Walnut. Um, we're also asking about the addition to the library, which I think Alex can probably speak to the best. Um, in terms of the access, um, you had mentioned the, the loading dock access. So are you looking at pedestrian access and what the route would be? Pedestrian access. So yes, what, what would the... Um and access the, the northern, uh, southern plazas. Go all the way up to Walnut Street, round about over on the front side of the Got it. Uh, so the current route is down Medford, Walnut, and then around the library. So um, are the access on the eastern side of the site, um, if you're coming along Medford, you will have um, the cross. This is, you're correct, a loading dock access for a secondary loading. Um, the, the pedestrian path system has a set of stairs that um, cut up the eastern side of the site as well as a switchback ramp system that allows ADA accessibility on that side of the site. Um, there's still the opportunity on the library that exists with a set of steps and then a walkway. Um, we'll be studying this area in terms of accessibility, so if you have any specific ideas, the wiki maps that Ashley mentioned during the transportation section, um, that's a great uh, tool to utilize and, and give us your feedback on those types of access points. But I think from Walnut and Medford, the main access is really going to be um, this area, whether it's stairs or ramp system. So if you're looking to go to the western half of the site, you're able to, um, this is a, an older rendering. We actually had recent meetings with GLX where the stairways and pathways have shifted, but there will be access along the northern side of the site to the stairways that then cut up to the field. And again, the field access can then be um, utilized through this stairway. That's a public access open air stairway. It's under an awning, so tough to read on this map. Um, and then ultimately in the campus plan, we're looking at accessibility from the field level Sorry, I lost my clicker. From the field level that um, has a set of stairs and switchback ramps that we've studied in the past, as well as um, an elevator that would get you from field access to the um, plaza access. So both of these are part of the campus um, plan that we're developing. And again, would like to hear any feedback that you guys have. Alex can speak to the library question. So as we mentioned earlier, our charge is not to design any or program any of the three remaining buildings that are on the site, the library, the 1895, or the city hall. But as good master planners and planners for the site, we do want to make sure that we're not doing work uh, that would have to be undone in the future. Uh, back in the mid to late 90s, there was a plan for putting an addition onto the back of the uh, central library. So we took our cues from that back when we were doing the initial high school plans. Maybe some of you early on were there when people said, why not connect the high school to the library and share those resources? You know, we know in talking with Glenn and others in the city that that really was not a good functional idea. Uh, so they have uh, their independence, but in those earlier plans, we did show the hint that maybe that would still be the logical place for a library addition. I think that would be one of the things that we would kind of, the city would like to hear about how you feel about uh, the architecture of the remaining three elements. The 1895 building, 
It's a little hard to see, but that dark line behind it, that represents about a 20-foot drop at the back. Again, talking about these, uh, these sort of um, belvedere's, these overlook points. So we don't really see any additions happening to the 1895 building. Uh, City Hall probably also retains its sort of footprint as today. But we do know from an accessibility perspective, we need to plan for getting uh, people up and into those buildings in a, a MAB acceptable manner. So that'll be part of our planning study as well. We can't just kind of have those steps that tear us in. Luckily, the library is right at grade. You can uh, stroll right in uh, today. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, yes. An old and a fat, how many steps would there, how many stairs would there be between, between the, the DLX station and, the, and City Hall, since that's the City Hall State Subsidy? So I'd like to be a bit of a smart one on this one. So the question was, I'm old and I'm fat, how many stairs? You'll be thin and you'll be young. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, the grade difference between the GLX and the um, City Hall Plaza, so it goes from a level of 107 down to a level of... 81. Sorry. Um, this is, the, the plaza level is 107, the field level is 81, and then um, GLX is at 50. So you'll be... So if you have a 6-inch riser, 50 foot, it's 100 steps. And, sorry, just a little context. If you've been on the backside of Tufts, right, that's pretty much it. Or if you've been up the long escalator in Porter Square. We, early on, we were using those as sort of familiar reference points. No, we're not. And they cut the V out the funiculari as well. So, sorry. <laughs> An escalator. Yes, unfortunately, no. Yes, sir. In addition to representing the community with the GLX project, through that, being involved in that, we organized the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association, and one of the things we've been really talking about is that connection between Gilman Square and that side of the city and the Central Hill, between the station and Central Hill. I mean, we've really got a connection to the rest of the world coming to us through Gilman Square. It almost becomes a new front door if you're using public transportation and we're trying to walk and bike more and that kind of thing. I think it'd be really great with wayfinding, with creating some kind of entrance way from there so that really be the gateway to City Hall, the library the high school, a way to celebrate the Highlanders because that's going to be our home field, if I understand it correctly. Um, so I really hope that in the process of developing this, that that gets incorporated in there. Maybe there's a way of reaching out, connecting with the station design folks to be able to have an overlap there to really make that work. That would be really awesome. So to talk to you, we have been meeting with GLX. We've actually been working with them quite a lot between the School Street connection, because the community path exits at School Street right where our driveway exits, the Medford Street, because we have a, a right-of-way out to the public way there, and where our stairs comes down to the landing at the station at the he uh, station head. And to go back, the GLX is planning two elevators, one at School Street and one roughly in the middle of the site to bring you up to the community path um, elevation for the middle of the site and to bring you up to School Street. And then the, high, the campus plan will investigate an elevator at the back of the 1895. Um, it's being planned for as part of the wall that's being built so that there will be elevator access. You won't have to walk all the stairs. Um, one other element, oh, sorry, I'm going to quickly address the, um, the new front door. That was something that we had thought about a lot during the design process. Um, we actually have a fairly large sign. It's on this wall that's going to be overhanging. Um, it's probably like a 10-foot retaining wall, a large metal sign that will introduce you to the Somerville High School campus. So since that field is part of the high school site, we have signage as well. Um, 
but the the GLX team we've been working with um, in terms of the entryway that that is on their territory so it's something that we have a set of stairs um, that we're open to working with them on but we we definitely thought about that as a second front door that's a great point as uh, the team explained where the current entrances to the GLX are both on Medford Street and on School Street, um, our team, um, Brad Rawson, who spoke to introduce this project, is working to uh, working with the GLX team uh, to sort of reserve space for a future uh, connection to Gilman Square that is not part of the Green Line project, uh, but they're sort of setting aside space uh, to make sure that there's a an ability for a connection um, in the future. Uh, so that, that would be a, a fourth, a third entrance um, to the station. Um, so they're working on that. It is called Gilman Square Station, but the way to get to the station is via school or Medford Street. Are you saying an Yeah, it will be a bridge, a pedestrian bridge. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, so um, the city is like super diverse, or it was, but, um, but um, any of the plants or anything, do you think you can put things for, like my grandfather came from Portugal, and they, I know you're not supposed to now, but back then we bring some plants in, um, you know, like trees, shrubs, things like that, that make us unique, and some houses still have that here, so they Lighting on the floor, like, uh, if, if they have it at, like, Disney World, but they also have it at, like, some um, parks that I've seen, because I travel a lot, that, like, at nighttime, they kind of, like, light up. I don't know if that's, like, you or not, but, like, some kind of lighting around the parks and or, like, the field would be kind of cool, especially, like, around the community path and going up to the field. Yeah. Um, the two comments were, uh, Somerville is a very diverse area. Would we be able to incorporate plants that reflect that diversity in the places that um, people in Somerville are originally from? Uh, and the second question or comment was, um, are we able to integrate lighting at a, a low lighting floor, um, bollard level, uh, into the playground and field space? So the first question is a tough one because we're not, we're not able to, um, like they used to, bring plants across that are not native or have some type of um, invasive species. There are plants that we can look at that might have some type of connection to um, other countries. So that would be a very interesting element uh, for the rest of campus. I think um, kind of especially in this area of the site that is representational of City Hall where a lot of people of diverse cultures may come. Um, so that's a great comment, we can, we can look into that. And then um, the idea of lower lighting is also an interesting one. I know the city has certain um, standards that they like to use in their park system, so we would try and work with, within those, but um, that's, a, that's a great idea in terms of using those types of spaces at night or dusk. Um, it creates an interesting landscape element, so thank you. If it's tied to the high school schedule, sure. And then the other question was, how do you submit um, comments for any part of this presentation? I'll take that one first because it's easier. Um, we have the website that we'll have at the end of this um, presentation as well as an email. Um, the website is, Kristen. Kristen's over there. Um, something slash central master plan. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. So the project website is somervillema.gov slash Central Hill Plan. Um, and then the email address is centralhill at somervillema.gov. And again, if you forget this, you can just call 311, and they will give you all of this information, which is such a wonderful resource to have because that's way easier to remember than everything that I just said. Um, and then I think in terms of, maybe I'll, since I'm up here, take the um, question about the timing. And so I think kind of if you were here and you heard the question about some of the transportation interventions, it's kind of the same thing that 
some aspects will need to be done as part of the high school project, but part of what we're going to be looking at with what comes out of the Central Hill Campus Plan project is what can we do over time? How can we phase things so that we can do things as appropriate and as we have the resources to do them? So hopefully we'll have um, some really great ideas that we can put into practice and develop a timeline for how we can make them become a reality. Were there any other questions I should yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, in addition to submitting ideas about program for the landscape spaces, we also want to hear your ideas about um, maybe amenities that are missing or amenities you'd like to see around campus, as well as um, what what makes a campus or what would make the space feel inviting to you. So any any kind of comments and suggestions you have for us, we would love to hear it. Are there any other questions? The question is, what is our maintenance plan for the pavers in the plaza spaces and pedestrian areas? So as part of the high school plan, we have met with the maintenance team to inform them of um, the spaces that are pavers versus concrete and what some of those best practices are, how to maintain them. Um, I believe, M Melissa, did you have it? Nope, that was it. Yeah, so we were, <laughs> we were trying to be proactive in letting them know um, what the design intent for those spaces are. I think the fact that we have um, specific pedestrian zones that are less vehicular oriented are going to help, and the fact that that's our overriding goal will hopefully... Um, increase the maintenance. It's going to be a very public, very forward-facing element of both City Hall and the high school. Um, so trying to have a plan, we're hoping that it, it'll maintain um, at a higher level than other parts that have been asphalted over. Um, the question is, what are we planning for ADA tactile strips? Um, so we have your typical, um, what is the raised profile? Rumble strips? Tactile warning strips that will be in between the uh, bollards. So anywhere that you see kind of these dots and the crosswalks um, will have that grade uh, become a full accessible space that will have um, the tactile strips in between the bollard spaces. Paver. It'll be a paver. It will be. So I've seen a lot, I don't know why, some reason I pay attention, I've seen them failing a okay. lot. Okay. Um, in Brookline, they did a project along Beacon Street where they're pulling them all and they're putting in the steel ones. Sure. Um, at the East Stoneville Community School, they're also failing and they're about three years old. Okay. So, um, Good to know. We'll, we'll, we will look into that. Thank you for your comment. Yes. Hello again. I should have mentioned, if you haven't already, if you want to get project updates and if you want to be reminded what the website is and how to find us and how to comment, make sure that you signed in, one. And two, make sure that you checked, I want to be signed up for the email list so that you'll get 
project updates and emails and information that way as well. So you don't have to remember all, all of these different websites and email addresses. Um, but again, if you ever have questions and you're like, uh, uh, I can't find it on the website, I'm not sure where the email address is, just call 311 and they will point you in the right direction on this project and anything else. So they're a really great resource. So now we're going to transition to the conversation about monuments. Thank you. I'm Lorraine Finnegan. I'm filling in for Lisa Howe. I'm the project manager from SMMA. Lisa had a tummy bug and most unusual not to be here. But I have my cohort here, Brian Bishop, who we've been working with closely. Brian is the uh, chair of the Veterans, the Veterans, Commission. Veterans Commission. So monuments have a big part of the Central Hill. They're a big part of them today. And as part of the high school project, we went out and we documented all the different types of monuments. And monuments, uh, there's markers, there's some art, there's some artifacts. So there's a lot of different things that mean a lot to many different people on the site. And we wanted to understand what they are, where they came from, and really take, you know, take account of them and understand what we're going to do with them. So the items that are highlighted in yellow are being removed as part of the high school project. They're going to be restored because many of the monuments need restoration work. And currently, they're planned to be delivered somewhere within the city limits. That could be back at this site or it could be somewhere else. But the high school project has the cost to remove them from the site, restore them, and deliver them somewhere else, either back here or somewhere else in the city. The items in orange are being reinstalled at the city. And this PowerPoint will be up on the website so you can look at each individual item and understand what it is. And the items in blue are not part of the high school project and they will be specifically part of the campus plan because that way we'll capture every single item on the site. So to give you a sense, they, they range from the memorial cannon, cannons all the way to a payphone box that somebody has painted and people consider it an art exhibit on the Central Hill. And everybody wanted to either talk about it, maintain it, and understand where it is. Not all of them are related to a memorial some are a class of 2010 stone. One of them is the first Congressional Unitarian Post marker, which will stay on the site because that is marking the site of the first church, so there is no value and no reason to move that off site. And others, like the women of Union Square Post, was moved here. So this, that is not original to this site. It was relocated here. So there's many different things that are occurring and many different types that are occurring on the site, and we've documented them all. And as part of this process, we're going to be discussing them, specifically the monuments. So the memorial cannons, Korean War, Vietnam War, Spanish War, Civil War. And then we have the Dilboy Monument right in front of City Hall, the Union Square post plaque that we discussed, which has been moved from Union Square. And while it's not a memorial, it is the honor roll, the summer of an honor roll. So Dilboy is not going to move. That is something we've already talked about. The Union Square post is not necessarily a memorial and will be talked about and will be dealt with as part of the campus plan, but is not what we're defining within the monuments. And again, the honor roll may, may stay, may become something else, but again, it doesn't fall under the monuments. So we're looking at these five items. There has been discussion about whether or not they should move to the Veterans Cemetery. And there are members who have fought in all wars except the Civil War and the Spanish War buried at that cemetery. So there will be confirmation, uh, con, uh, excuse me, um, there will be discussion about whether all five move, only the three move, you know, that's the type of feedback we want to have, that's the type of communication we want to have. Does it matter where it goes? Is it better to stay on Central Hill? Would it be better served at the Veterans Cemetery, for example? And in case people are not aware, this is where we are at the Central Hill campus, and this is where the Veterans Cemetery is down at Broadway, right behind the Stop and Shop. So you'll see all these markers. These are all the graves down at the Veterans Cemetery. So part of this process, we've already met with the uh, Veterans Commission, and Kristen and Brian met with Somerville Historic Commission, because some of these are historic, to talk about should they stay or should they go. No decision has been made. We're looking for input. There's conversation going on in the community. Right now, they're scattered around the existing site. One idea could be if they are relocated to this location, 
that there are some graphic wayfinding or information saying what used to be on that site and where you could find them. Another description was, as Laura mentioned, that they are organized in an alley, and again, that there is information on them so that as you progress through the site, you are informed as to what they are and where they are on the site. So a lot of conversation is going to go into, we're hoping, go into where these are on the site, where they stay on the site, should they leave, and if so, where should they go? So there is the next Veterans Commission. Has it been confirmed on the 19th? The 20th. Okay, so we'll change this before we post it on the website. So the next Veterans Commission will be at the um, on the 20th at Somerville Council on Aging. So I know the commission is looking for feedback. They're looking to hear from people to see what do you feel, how do you feel, do you have any preference to where it should go, um, do you think they should all go, should they stay together, should it be only relative to the the people who are actually fought in those wars who are buried at that site, if it is veterans, and are there other sites? Are there other sites that haven't been considered? So, Brian, do you have anything you want to add? Just a couple of yeah. Thank you, Lorraine. I also want to introduce the members of the, uh, the Veterans Commission. Uh, I have Norbert D'Amato, Elizabeth Menahan, and um, Ricardo Maldonado. And the meeting on the 20th is completely and totally for this discussion. Um, it's something that we've been looking at for, for quite some time. The commi this commission is kind of new, um, and we're very, very pleased that the city wanted to include us in this discussion. Um, I have spoken with um, uh, Mr. Bobby Hardy, who is the commander of the Dillboy Post down in Davis Square. It's something he and I have been discussing since I got here a couple of years ago. And um, we came up with two possibilities. Uh, for where the monuments would be located. Um, one, of course, would be here on this site, um, as long as they were arranged in a dignified and respectful manner, and that they told a story. Um, in some cities and towns, you'll go and they just throw them all over the place, and there's no rhyme or reason to them. But each one of these memorials tells a story, and it tells a story of wars fought, battles fought, and Americans who lost their lives because of them. So we want to make sure that they're in a place where they can be respected, revered, and there's a place where you can reflect. It's very important that we do that. So Central Hill is one option. The other option that came up um, has been uh, the Veterans Cemetery. And the reason that came up, how many of you, and I know this is a loaded question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, how many of you knew where the Veterans Cemetery was? Okay, so a good, good number of you. There are certain people who I have talked to who live in that neighborhood who never knew that. They thought it was a park. And the reason they thought it was a park was because the mar grave markers are flat markers. You can't see them from the street. If you're from the street and you look in there, it looks just like a really nice, grassy park. So much that someone even suggested cutting an entrance to the back of it so more people could come through it and use it as a walkway. That didn't go over very well. Um, in the cemetery, you have um, persons who fought in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and one individual who was killed in the Beirut bombings in 1983. We have not had anyone buried in that cemetery, and I consider this a good thing, since 1983. The entire cemetery is a killed in action uh, or killed or, or died because of wounds sustained in battle cemetery. So it's specific. And there's a lot of real estate there. So the idea was is to put the, um, the at first, the, all the monuments, um, the war monuments in the cemetery. And we know they fit. We know they'll fit. But just as a sidebar, we, someone suggested, well, why don't you just put the monuments who, who reflects who's buried there? And then you can cut some new walkways in and you can tell those stories of those wars. The original thought was is we keep them together. And I think talking to the commission and whatnot, that's what we want to do. We want to try to keep them all together and to tell a story. But the two options that we are looking at right now as a commission, or as they are looking at as a commission, is either Central Hill or in the Veterans Cemetery. And that's really to bring a lot more awareness of the people who are buried there. 
so we can tell those stories and to continue to educate and bring awareness to the veterans who serve the city and who made the ultimate sacrifice. So that's what we have now, our meeting on the 20th. That is an open meeting for anyone who wants to come and discuss that with us, uh, who wants to have any ideas. Any idea is good. You know, these are the two ideas that we have right now, but there may be more. But we want to be able to make a decision and a well-informed decision for people who really care about it. Hey, Eddie. Milk Row the problem with Milk Row is, is that um, space. You don't really have as much space there. And to be honest with you, on Somerville Lab, there right beside Market Basket, that's not really a reflective space to put them. Um, and it was, it was thought of, but they were just thinking that it might just be, I mean, these monuments aren't small. So to put them in there, and they're still trying to refurbish that area, they're trying to, they were like one thing at a time. Uh, so we just wouldn't have the space to put them there. Anyone else? I guess we'll go to the discussion. Yes, ma'am. I, we, go to, we might as well, yeah. So, the, there's one monument, the Vietnam Monument from 1985, was a joint project of Somerville and Cambridge. It had been in Union Plaza. It got moved because there was reconstruction of Union Plaza, which we seem to do about every 10 or 20 years. Um, I was told at that time that the Cambridge Veterans Group had okayed that move. About a year later, I was told that the Cambridge veterans were very upset about that move. Now, maybe there's more than one group in Cambridge. I don't know who was consulted and who wasn't consulted. But that's a joint monument, and that's a very important consideration in determining where you know it should be. In my opinion, it should have been moved to Quarter Square, which is on the border. And maybe, you know, we've had it 35 years. Cambridge should have it for another 35 years. <laughs> So I just want to put that out that it's not really part of this whole package. So her, her statement about, and this is the Vietnam Memorial. Uh, bear in mind, I've been here for two and a half years. Anything that happened before me, I have no idea. Um, uh, Mr. Hardy has been a great wealth of knowledge for me, as far as the, especially the Vietnam Memorial, because you're right, that was a joint venture between Somerville and Cambridge. The way it was facing in Union Square was is that part of it was facing Cambridge for the Cambridge people and Somerville for the Somerville people. Am I correct there, Bobby? That was part of the beginning of the plan, but the original place was supposed to go on. It was supposed to be down Elm Street, down by Willow Lab, but the traffic just down there, it was too damaging to it. So that's why they moved to Union Square. And that's where it's set. So it's been moved two times. Okay. It moved once, and it's up here the second time. But it's not a unilateral decision. That's really And if you think you're going to move it every couple of years, that if those two pieces of granite are going to fall apart. Okay. And that's granite that comes from uh, Italy. It's just like the now Memorial in D.C. Similar soil come out of the same quarry. So. Just can't move. It's going to be moved one time. So that's the stuff. I, mean, I was joking about moving multiple times, but I, as I said, the point is it's not a unilateral decision. It's not just someone else to decide. Bobby, what year did it move out of Union Square? Do you remember? It's going to be about maybe 10 years now. Okay. And when they moved it, it didn't come up too easy. The, the trains moaned and groaned when we went up by the lab and put it in this messy place now. But the way you see it now, that's not the complete monument. There's pieces missing from that you don't know of. There's benches and flagpoles go with that. That is not the complete set. Each bench collective, uh, is each bench in the service. So there should be five benches, and the city took them and put them in storage, both be down the DPW yard, and our flagpoles that go with this monument. So there's eight pieces still missing on this. And that's a good question. I have asked that question, and they say they're at DPW. I've just never gone down there. I haven't. I mean, I don't see it. They say they're here, but I, I've never seen them physically. But they, I, they won't let me into the yard and go look at them. But there's five pieces, eight pieces. I will say this before the 20th of June meeting. I'll go down there myself, and I'll go see where they are. And if they if they don't know where they are, then we're going to find out what happened to them. Because that's been brought up before. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a sculptor and decorative arts conservator. So this is what I do, is coming in and restoring works of art. And as you said at the very beginning, you know, they're really, it's exactly what you're saying as well, is that 
there's a central core to the monument, but the monument is actually really part of a memorial. The memorial is much larger. The memorial usually has benches, the black holes, the paving, the seats around it that are in stone. Everything has been designed, hopefully, with this idea of contemplation, dignity, as you were mentioning. And so the idea of putting them all in one place, keeping them together, is an anathema to me. They're not supposed to have been like that. I mean, some may have been, but the Soldier and Sailors Monument absolutely was not. It was central on hill, the hill. There was no playground around it, which I find really, you know, I know where it's wrapped for rooms, but it's like it just drives me nuts. And then the uh, cannon and stuff that are there are just really neglected. People don't even know they're there. So, I mean, that whole thing, you know, was a really uh, beautiful and setting for that wonderful sculpture. And it looked out onto Somerville and from the hill. And also it was a central location that was chosen because it was, you know, central to all of Somerville. So I just find the discussion, I love the idea of the memorial, the uh, Vietnam Memorial, having all the benches and everything restored. So whether you can find them or not, when they go back, the setting should recreate that type of... I wholly, hardly agree. Absolutely. Okay. Nope. I, that's good. I like that. Bobby, did you have anything else? Because I know you had some okay. items. I'm going to give you a, a little uh, import from different memorials. If you look at the memorial that's in uh, front of the uh, Korean memorial up in uh, front of the old gym, there's a little memorial that's in front of the Korean memorial. I sat on that uh, commission and it took us three years to decide what we were going to do there. Past uh, Mickey Grit, he designed that stone edge that represents the 38 parallel in Korea. And all the stones that sat around it, that was originally up there at uh, the high school. And what we did, we sat, took us three years just to go through people's notes and letters that came back to get it to that. And we had to make sure everything was spelled the same way. And that's how that came about. Now, the Spanish American War, that was. Uh, Needlessly, no maintenance on it for the longest period of time. Uh, we had two uh, directors here when uh, Mickey Curtin was there and we had a Jim O'Connor. Mickey Curtin retired at that time. We had some extra money in the budget. And uh, myself and uh, John O'Connor, we said, hey, let's do this memorial. So we polished that up. And we had some people walk by, they wanted to know when we put up the new monument. Because we cut the trees back and everything else, it's all neglect up there. We had to replace all the stone out front. The concrete was deteriorated, and that's where that's in. Now we'll go to the uh, the honor roll up in uh, in front of the, the uh, city hall. Now that one there is an honor roll. That's not a World War II m memorial. That's an honor roll. But the people around there are World War World War II, as you see up the top. And in the middle panels, you're going to see some of it in yellow. If you look at it, those are the deceased members from Vietnam. Then you also look around the, the next panel down, and the different glasses, there's the Korean names up there of all those soldiers. And I've been pressing for the last 25 years to get our names up the Vietnam veterans, and they told us no. It would cost too much money. I think 50 years waiting, I should be recognized to have my name put up here in the city of Thunder. And plus the other 4,000 of us that were some of the residents should be put up there. And also I would say, as you know, I'm the commander of the John Gilboy Post, and we have a new post built down in Davis Square. Most of the non-vets we transferred from here to there. We would like our memorial up at our post up there, so we can have it situated right there in the middle. And we'll take care of it, because that's been neglected also when it was down here this week. And, and now, if you look at it, you get the kids up there to use it for uh, the rollerblades and everything else. In the cemetery, it was also done the same way. People from the projects over there on North Street, they use that for a skating board and jump board. So by putting them all in the cemetery, you can't protect them. We will protect the non memorial. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Yes, no, maybe. Oh, yes, sir. Brian, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, uh, is there any 
thought, I mean, in other cities I've seen where some of the large memorials would wind up being the center of the square, and then nothing would be a way of designing that. I know that there are some plans for Gilman Square to have sort of a central space to it. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking is currently there is that green space down to Gilman Square, it's a triangular space. I know according to the neighborhood plan, it's supposed to be a building, but I think public sentiment seems to be leaning more toward green space. That might be a way to make that a usable space, have it be associated with the uh, G station that is associated with this hill, and have it be a little bit more centrally located. If you have something like that considered. Um, those are just two things that I can explain about that. That's one I hadn't heard. That's, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, and that would be part of the greater whole GLX and, and everything else going from there. The city property, the city property yes. Um, anyone else before we go into that? That's actually an interesting idea that we'll look at. The bottom line here, as far as the commission goes, and, and for me as the Veterans Commissioner, um, I've been doing this for a minute, about 25 years of it. And whenever we have a monument or a memorial, um, upkeep is always paramount. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is, is these go up, just like, and Bobby's seen this happen. Um, and um, ma'am, what was your name? Oh, Barbara. Oh, I think I know you. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so Barbara and Bobby say, you know, they become neglected. And it goes on for a while. And then a while, and someone says, oh, you know, we need to do something about that. And it goes on for a long time more. I mean, look at the Civil, the Civil War Angel itself. I mean, that's just horrible. I mean, it's black and green. And I mean, it needs, and it's going to be restored. But still, I mean, we're, we're talking how long has that been going on. Honoring the service and sacrifice of people who wore the nation's uniform and in cases died for it is of the utmost paramount issue. This is not a political issue. This is a humanist issue. This is a service issue. Whether you served or your parents or your family, somebody in your family served, doesn't matter. Somebody raised their right hand to swear an oath to this country and to support and defend our Constitution. The least we can do is ensure that the monuments and the memorials that are in our city for the people who served our country is to make sure that those monuments and memorials are protected that they're kept up in good shape, but they're in a place and a location that is indicative of respect and honor and reflection. That's the most important thing. And I try to push this idea home quite a bit because I think we forget it. So what we're hearing tonight and especially for uh, Bobby Hardy, who I have the utmost respect for, and thank you for your service. Um, but for, for you to be fighting as long as you have for this, we want to make sure we do this right. We have an opportunity to do this right. And that's what we want to do. And I thank you, everyone for their comments. And the commission's going to be working very hard on this. Um, and we want to hear from you. We want, we want to know the good, the bad, the ugly. We don't really care what you have to say, but say it if you have an idea, a concern, or whatever. Because once, because as you can tell, these things, when they move, <laughs> they're going to be moved once, at the most twice, moved off and moved back to make sure that we truly honor the people who served our country. And if, yes, sir? The first time we went into Iraq, into Iraq, 1992. Okay, so that's 25 years. The city hasn't done anything for those veterans yet, too. But we are going to put a sewer up and down on our property down in the BMW to recognize it. I know that the mayor, as well as, well as um, Alderman McLaughlin, have, been, have brought that up. Um, we here in Somerville are very fortunate as we did not lose one of our citizens in Iraq, Afghanistan. But don't forget, we're still at war. 
So having a monument and a memorial, having a monument to service of Iraq and Afghanistan is important. And that is, on, that is something that we're definitely looking at. So um, that's where we are. So if you have any questions or whatnot, we have all the information to contact um, the, um, the folks here who are handling this plan. Um, or you can call my office, just call Veteran Services. You can talk to me and I can pass it along to the commission. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who are here who served, Rick, Bobby, and anyone else, thank you for your service. And thank you for the dedication to the city of Somerville. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And just a reminder, that meeting is the 20th, and I will change that on the website before that goes up on the website. At the Council on Aging. I will add that to this as well, just so everyone has that. So we are essentially done. I'm going to see if I can jump. There we go. <laughs> okay. So we are through our presentation piece. Um, we've really tried to make this short so that we understand, get the information out, but we want to make this a participatory. The city wants to make this participatory. They want to hear your feedback. This campus plan the implementation of this campus plan will take years. I think everybody understands that because of resources. They want to make sure that they've heard you and that they get it right, that we all get it right, and that we plan for in the future. And anything that occurs in interim stages does not detract from that but can only add to that. So participation feedback is vitally important to us. We did issue a comment card tonight, so if you didn't get to use the comment card on your way in, please sign the comment card on the way out. It also has a box to tick. Uh, Kristen has more. Did everyone fill one in? We're trying to gather information on how you use Central Hill, um, how you get here, what you use City Hall for, as well as if you want to be on the mailing list to get this information. Yes. We had it at the end of each section, but you're more than welcome to ask whatever you'd like right now. Now is fine. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I had a question about the playground. Yep. Um, so right now, you know, there is a playground that's for the public. And I know that in the new design, there is a playground not where the current one is, a little bit further back, I think. Um, and I missed the discussion to know who would be able to use that. Is that one that's going to be available? So the, the playground that's being rebuilt as part of the high school project is for the child care program at the high school. It will be available to residents after school hours. It's gated so that it's only used by the program during school days. But the campus plan will be looking at where the playgrounds that will be removed as part of the high school project will be reinstated back on the Central Hill. So the plan is to have another playground? Yes, for the public on Central Hill. We're looking at every. We're looking at all opportunities, including near adjacent to the library. Yeah, on a personal note, I feel like that combination is very important. There's a lot of um, schools in that neighborhood that actually use that yep. playground now, and they usually will give you back that on a visit to the library for story time, and also the families that use it, um, especially on the weekends. And it's so, yeah, it's a great like one two combination. Yeah, so the, the comment is about the location of the playground and its adjacency to the library and use by preschool. We've observed through the years of studying the high school project now who uses it and how often it's used. And we've talked a lot and with Glenn even about, you know, the future addition space, potential addition of the library and planning for that and planning for that accessibility and that adjacency. And you having those different grades of playground together um, has a lot of benefit. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. So as we mentioned, here's the email address for questions, centralhill at somervillemass.gov. Um, and again, just on our schedule, this is our first community meeting. We're having three community meetings. They're scheduled. So September 13th and October 18th. And the goal is to have the campus plan complete by the end of the year. And part of that plan will be an understanding of the schedule for implementation of ideas coming out of that plan. So... I think we'll have a lot more information, um, maybe even hopefully some decisions at the September 13th meeting. 
and then continue to move forward to an October meeting, and then finally with the campus plan being issued by the city so everyone understands what's the long-term range. Kristen, would you like to close us? Thanks to all of you for coming out and spending so much time with us. I know there are at least two other city meetings happening tonight. There have been a lot of city meetings all week. So you taking time out of your busy lives to come and share your thoughts with us, it really means a lot to us and will give us a lot of really good input into the process. And I really hope you'll come to the other meetings. And in the meantime, please engage with us on the website, email us, let us know your thoughts as you are walking through and you have an idea. Please continue to be in dialogue with us because we really want this to be the most welcoming, user-friendly, sustainable place that we can make it um, and really take advantage of all the things that are happening between the high school, um, changes in Gilman Square and the Green Line, and what's happening in Union Square to really make this a really wonderful place. So thanks for all your thoughts. And in advance, I'm going to thank you for your continued engagement. I hope I'll see you all at our next meeting in September and hear from you in between. Thank you so much.